welcome to Oaken Bros. This is Eric. I'm Michael, and if you want to learn about the secrets of the universe, the law of attraction, mysticism, brohood, movies, gambling, pop culture, archangels, magic, good food, business, health, family, and mediumship, smash the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, press that bell notification, spread this video around like peanut butter and jelly, but do not spread it around on bread because we have Dr. <laughs> William Davis with us today, the author of Undoctored, and I, you won't be able to see it, but there's like a million... Uh, what do you call it? little like rabbit um, ears here and my favorite book probably in my top five favorite books of all time wheat belly also I have a million uh, folded pages in there this book yeah. changed this book changed our family's guess, life yeah I just when, say. We, when we read that book um, we were in search of you know the best diet to be on and we had success with Atkins <laughs> in in the past and then all of a sudden your book came out and we're like, wow, this was written by a doctor and he's saying, don't eat bread. And then you just go down that rabbit hole. First, I just want to say thank you for coming on, Dr. Davis. It's an absolute thanks, honor. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. And thanks for doing these podcasts to educate people. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's, a, it's, it's absolutely our pleasure. So um, I have a question. The Wheat Belly brand is amazing. How did you actually come up with the name Wheat Belly? You know, I was working to help people of all crazy things. I, I had set up a place called Milwaukee Heart Scan going back 20, 20 plus years ago. And this was just a device that scanned your heart and showed you how much coronary atherosclerotic plaque you had by generating something called a coronary artery calcium score. It's an indirect um, index of how much plaque you have because the more plaque you have, the more potential for it to rupture, lead to heart attack, death, etc. Well, how do you put a stop to this? Well, back then, the conventional answer, the best, they actually called it this, optimal medical therapy, which is <laughs> if you do nothing and you have a heart scan score, say, of 300, if you do nothing, it goes up by about 25% per year. And with, e with each passing leap in score, you're closer to dying, a heart attack, getting stents, bypass, or all that nasty stuff that hospitals love. Well, if you go on, the best there is, the best there is in conventional medicine, which is aspirin, a low-fat diet, and a high dose of a statin cholesterol drug, how fast does the uh, coronary calcium score go up? And we help publish these data. 25% per year has no effect whatsoever. That's the best they have. So when you, my colleagues actually said this, uh, don't repeat the scan because we don't know what to do. <laughs> so what do you do, though, at a street level when people are freaking out on me? I've got thousands of people coming. What the hell do I do? My score went up from 300 to, you know, uh, 410 and then on and on, et cetera. My math might be a little off, but you get the idea. Well, sure. my colleagues, of course, said things like there's a fair amount of unscrupulous behavior in healthcare, unfortunately. And a lot of them would say, well, let's do the real test. Let's do a heart catheterization to see if you need Stents or bypass, which, by the way, is tantamount to malpractice. In other words, if I took Eric and Eric says, hey, I bike, I go for walks, I feel good, I lift weights, I have no symptoms, but you have a heart scan scar, <gasps> we're going to do the real test and see if you need preventive bypass surgery, or pre which is ridiculous, and that has been disproven numerous times. It has no benefit whatsoever. But how do you put a stop to this? Well, it became clear that the real cause for so much coronary disease, and this is not my speculation, by the way, this is established <laughs> fact, is not cholesterol. Cholesterol is an outdated, beaten up Model T <laughs> of trying to gauge cardiovascular risk. So I, I was looking for better answers for all these people freaking out. And there were no conventional answers. There were zero conventional answers back then. And so one of the markers, one of the things, one of the factors that leads to coronary atherosclerotic plaque and thereby heart attack, et cetera, is an excess of small LDL particles, very different from LDL cholesterol. Well, so these people with these positive heart scan scores freaking out on me and having year over year higher, higher scores. Uh, if you do lipoprotein analysis, not cholesterol testing, you will see virtually every last one of them have huge amounts of this small LDL part. I'm talking like 2,400 nanomoles per liter, particle count per volume. Well, it was clear from uh, evidence that came out of Ron Krauss's laboratory at UC, at UC Berkeley and other laboratories that there's only two foods that cause this explosion in small LDL particles and other factors, 
grains and sugars. So I took wheat, grains, and sugars out of people's diet. I just gave them a two-page handout. I said, here, try this. We're going to try to reduce your small LDL particle. Well, okay, all right. They come back. Small LDL would drop from, say, 1987 to zero hmm. or some of the low. Not a 10%, 20%, 30%, not like a statin drug, but an absolute obliteration of that pattern in the majority. But they would say to me, why did my waist shrink by eight inches? Why, why am I no longer a diabetic? I had to stop my insulin, and my metformin, my bieta injections. Why did my rheumatoid arthritis go away? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, because the belly, there's so much, so many people coming back with dramatic losses of belly fat, visceral, inflammatory, visceral fat. That's, that's where the whole <laughs> wheat belly notion came around. But as, as you guys know, that's just part of the picture. It's really about mm -hmm. a lot of other things too. So it's amazing. Uh, I mean, that so, was, so that was my answer. let's stay on calcium scores. Eric and I lost Eric. I don't know if you have the picture. I we, do. Eric well, lost I'm, I'm about a hundred pounds. I'm going to put this up right now. Wow. Right, I'm, yeah, I'm so, oh, wow. Yeah. So you could actually see my fatty liver. Dr. That's Davis. Yeah. <laughs> so Great job, guys. now, yeah, Thank I was, you. you know, this morning I was 175 pounds. You know, that picture, I was probably right around 280. Wow. Um, so I've lost a ton of weight. I did my calcium score last year. It was 17. Now, I don't know if, you know, of course, the doctor was like, that's because you're eating, you know, <laughs> steaks and stuff like that. So the question is, could my calcium, that was my one and only calcium score. Could my calcium score have been higher and, it, and it's gotten better? based on my diet that I'm on now, which is basically ketogenic, you know, I'll have I probably 50 grams or less of carbohydrates per day. Absolutely. So what I often tell people is, you know, it's better than a CT heart scan. No, two CT heart scans. <laughs> Case <laughs> heart. So that right, we don't maybe your score uh, a year or two before that was 310, which can happen, by the way, we do it all the time. Or maybe it was zero. Or maybe we don't know. So we can only speculate. So the, the most revealing uh, score will be your next score. So if next score is zero, and by the way, at lowish scores like yours, 10, 30, 40, you can get back to zero uh, if doing the right thing. You can't do it with the statin drug, by the way. You can't do it with a damn low-fat diet. You can't do it with aspirin or a beta blocker, all those stupid things that are dispensed by my colleagues. But you can do it with doing things like eradicating foods at provoke formation of small LDL, correct insulin resistance, which we do just with the diet and a handful of nutritional supplements that are largely absent from modern life, and some attention to your microbiome. And you have magnificent hopes of reducing your score or at least putting a stop to that 25% per year increase. Eric and I were on a, we, we started out on a keto diet and we went to a carnivore diet. I had a calcium score and mine was a zero. I don't know my I don't know if my father my father had very low mm -hmm. cholesterol. We we were told it was cholesterol all these years. It was triglycerides and cholesterol, but I have a zero um and I'm 42 years old. How often should someone my age with, you know, I'm pretty healthy, I, you know, little I I've had asthma and allergies, but like how often should someone actually get a calcium score because mainstream doesn't do this and I want to talk to you about mainstream medicine. I had to go to an alternative doctor to get a, someone just like you who gave me fish oil, who gave me uh, vitamin D, who gave me um, uh, digestive enzymes, which I didn't even know this stuff existed. And I'm taking it. I haven't been sick in one year. I had chronic sinus infections gone. And, and I've introduced carbohydrates back into my diet slowly. Um, but ultimately, how many, how many times a decade should someone get a calcium score? Dr. Davis. It, it all depends. The, the standard advice, which is, I think, good advice, is guys should consider it 40 years old and above, and ladies 50 years old and above, only because ladies tend to develop heart disease about a decade after guys do. Now, that's a soft cutoff. If you said, well, my dad had a heart attack at age 37, you should reduce that, maybe get it at age 30. So right. it's soft, but in general, 40 for guys, 50 for ladies. Now, a guy like Eric with a low score... I tell, there's no hard and fast rules here, but I can tell you what I've done for many years since I started doing the CT heart scans 20 some years ago is a low score like that. Eric is not in danger. He's just, is extremely low. You're going to make my mom happy. Yeah. You're going to make mama, <laughs> thank mama goodness, very happy. Thank goodness this is recorded. You know, provided <laughs> Eric doesn't go to smoke crack cocaine or something crazy like that. Once in a while. His, his uh, risk for heart attack is very low. It's close to zero. I say close to zero. Nobody's really zero because people do crazy things like crack cocaine. 
right. uh, or methamphetamines or, or something. <clears throat> right. But in general, low score like that, I would consider it maybe in two or three years, something like that. Okay. Because there is some radiation, about 10 chest x-rays equivalent radiation. For, for mm -hmm. Michael, who's got a zero score, typically weigh about five years because the number of people who convert to positive in a, every year is, is relatively small, single digits. Okay. And so uh, now if, if you come back with another zero score, Michael, you are essentially freed for a lifetime. It's highly unlikely you ever develop heart disease. Now you might do another heart scan 10, 15 years right. after. Right, but it's it's you're extremely low risk. So now, if the score was five hundred, yeah, thousand, that's the situation where I suggest doing a scan about a year later, but preferably a year after you've identified and then corrected all the factors that led you to have a positive score. And so we do all these things we've talked about: eliminate the foods that cause provocation of small LDL particles. We correct the nu nutritional deficiencies that lead to insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is everywhere. It's, yep. it's more than two thirds of the U.S. population, probably more like eighty-five to ninety percent at this some right. degree. So we address vitamin D, the, the the thing, the nutrients that you just mentioned, Michael, omega three fatty acids. We do add iodine. I, I'm in Wisconsin and Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, et cetera, Ohio are a former formerly called the goiter belt. Uh, because 20 to 35% of the population here used to have big honking goiters right here mm -hmm. uh, and large thyroid glands from lack of iodine because we're, we're, we're not coastal. So mm -hmm. we, we add iodine and make sure you have thi optimal thyroid uh, status just because uh, there is also a silent epidemic of thyroid dysfunction, uh, largely due to a number of factors. But And then we also add magnesium because we drink filtered water and then some basic efforts to uh, rebuild a healthy microbiome. Oh my God. So you're talking about your Hashimoto's while we just mentioned the thyroid. I'm just right, saying. Shall, yeah. Sure. I'll go there. Yeah. I mean, I, I had Hashi, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease. My, um, my, my levels were all out of whack. My TSH was high. My, um, my, uh, antibodies were, were high. And, um, I, and that was while that was in 2012. And that was right around the time when I read wheat belly and I went on a ketogenic diet levels normalized but my thyroid was still bumpy. Then I went on a carnar carnivorous diet, which I basically cut out all plant food. My thyroid went smooth as glass. So now, you know, my thyroid is good. Eventually had to stop the carnivore diet. And I was actually watching one of your videos yesterday and it kind of all adds up that I just wasn't having any good gut bacteria to mm -hmm. eat, to, to function properly as far as going to the bathroom is concerned. So I added in some sweet potatoes and potatoes and whatnot, and that seemed to have just, and rice every once in a while, and that seemed to have leveled off my, uh, my bathroom issues. Um, so what question I wanted to ask you was, um, you've mentioned colleagues. Does the majority of the, of your colleagues, quote unquote, um, like, it's like you? Like, are you, are you, are you, are you friends with them? Like, are you the like, black sheep in the medical community, Dr. Davis? You know, to be honest, guys, most of my colleagues don't give a shit about nutrition. And so this is not even on their radar. They have really? no idea. Really? Yeah. But so how, could car how can a cardiology and nutrition not be in the same universe? I don't understand. There's an odd attitude that's gotten worse over the past three decades. And that is if there's no revenue, if there's no profit in some product or activity, you practice willful ignorance. That is, you're going to focus on the things that pay well for you and your healthcare system. By the way, doctors are now incentivized, almost every last one of them. Doctor, this is the administrator talk, hospital administrator. Doctor, the more revenue you generate for the system, the larger your end of quarter bonus. And we're talking about 25, 50 plus thousand dollar bonuses every quarter. So they're highly incentivized to get people like us with healthcare insurance and churn you for procedures and uh, MRIs and neurology consultations and tilt studies and all that kind of stuff that generates very rich revenue. That's why hospitals can justify adding on $70 million wings for cardiovascular health. And so uh, we have a system where the healthcare providers are very, very powerfully incentivized to churn you for money. And that means they pay attention to things that generate revenue. And they tend to just ignore or not look into, not understand, not study things that could have magnificent effects on your health, but don't pay. So if, it, if I, I can tell you also that I took great, when I was in practice, I don't practice anymore, but when I was in practice, I took great pains to educate my patients. 
if you have a heart scan score and you're scared out of your mind, right, with a score of a thousand, and we you have a explosive amount of small LDL and high triglycerides and fatty liver and insulin resistance and vitamin D deficiency and hypothyroidism and dysbiosis, disruption of bowel flora. Well, it takes, if I just hand you a prescription for Lipitor, it ain't going to cut it. So right. it took right. time, but I got so much flack from my, from the insurers. No, right. they essentially said, ask them if they have chest pain, if they can breathe. Okay. And if they are, and their cholesterol is okay. Your job is done. Unbelievable. So the stand, the prevailing standard of care is shockingly low and my colleagues meet that because that's how they get paid. So we have an odd uh, selection of a style of practice that favors doing almost nothing for health, not understanding health. And so sadly, uh, to be honest, most of my colleagues' eyes glaze over when I bring up the issues that you and I, are, you guys and I are, are interested in and your audience are interested in. It's right. not even on their radar. Or they, they 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 subscribe to conventional guidelines, such as the, the nonsense that comes out of the American Heart Association or the garbage that passes for the dietary guidelines from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services or the, the nonsense from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. They, they all agree, right? They all agree you should cut your fat, saturated fat, and eat more healthy whole grains and everything in moderation and move more, eat less. Then there'd be a diabetes would have been eradicated by now, right, Dr. Davis? Like we would have been done with it. It would have been over. It'd right? be a rare thing. Right. Exactly. Right. I was a diabetic 25 years ago. I'm not anymore. I have perfect blood sugars taking nothing. That is taking no drug. Yet diabetes is absolutely a man-made, a guideline-made disease. Very profitable, by the way. That's why you watch TV and wow. you see ads, ad after ad for Farsiga, to jail, <laughs> all the drugs for diabetes. When I'm going to bet you, if you guys track your hemoglobin A1C or your fasting glucoses, yeah. they yeah. plummet with, with no drugs whatsoever. So right. day in the life of Dr. Davis, what is your food? What, what are you eating today? <laughs> I, I made some bagels using almond flour and ground golden flaxseed and some psyllium seed. I put some uh, raw sam, like lox and bagels, you know, uh -huh. with some cream Maybe. cheese and some sliced bread. It was delicious. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still uh, eating through my turkey from Thanksgiving. So I'm going to really? make some turkey soup. I mean, very similar to what you guys do. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Dr. Yeah. Davis, let me ask you a question. Are you familiar with allergies? I mean, I know you're a cardiologist. So right now, Eric and I are getting endpoint testing, and they're only doing it in two locations in the United States, and it's showing what your body can withstand the food. So we're taking a nasal spray, and we're supposed to be desensitized to these allergens. And the one food I haven't eaten in 10 years, there were two foods that I was a, a one for, a, a level one, which is not allergic, was chocolate and wheat. And I don't eat wheat. Does that mean if I introduce wheat back into my diet or someone who's not, who doesn't have celiacs, I don't have celiacs. If someone doesn't have celiacs, does the same kind of like wrath that you've said in your books that wheat causes on the body, does that still kind of, does it, does it, does it apply to someone who's not allergic to wheat? Oh, absolutely. The vast majority of reactions, adverse reactions to the components of wheat are non-allergic. There, there are allergies to various protein components in wheat. Right. But the vast majority of reactions have nothing to do with allergic responses. So, for instance, the gliadin protein, that's the protein within gluten. Mm -hmm. uh, gliadin, we, we now know with good confidence, good science, that it opens up the intestinal barriers and allows foreign things, particularly bacterial breakdown products, into the bloodstream. By the way, only two things have that kind of effect where it increases the intestinal permeability. You know, people talked about gut leak for many years. Well, right. now we have the science. It's it's quite confident that there is such a thing as gut leak or intestinal uh, permeability. And the only two things, common things that increase gut permeability dramatically are the gliadin protein of wheat and, and related proteins and other grains, cyclin of rye, hordein of barley, zein of corn. So the gliadin protein and related proteins and uh, uh, dysbiosis, or s especially when you have 30 feet of dysbiosis, most dysbiosis, that is disruptions of bowel flora species, for all, because of all the things we've done, taking antibiotics as a kid, right. eating too many sugary uh, foods or drink soft drinks, soft drinks that are sweetened with synthetic sweeteners like aspartame, or get exposed to glyphosate in grains. Glyphosate right. is an herbicide, but it's also a very powerful antibiotic. 
And so all the things we've been exposed to have disrupted bowel flora, but in many of us, and I, I, I am guilty, by the way, of, of uh, underestimating just how, how many people have 30 feet of dysbiosis. That is not just the colon, where most gut bacteria are supposed to be, mm -hmm. but also in the ileum, jejunum, duodenum, and stomach. And the small bowel is not very tolerant to the nasties from stool, like E. coli, pseudomonas, and salmonella, because the small bowel has only a single layer of mucus lining, unlike the colon that has a, a much more vigorous dual layer of mucus lining. So the 30 feet of bacteria living and dying rapidly, they only live for a few hours to days, mm -hmm. trillions of them. When they die, a lot of their byproducts get through the intestinal barrier because part of proliferation of an unhealthy species is an increase in intestinal permeability. And that's called, that's a process called endotoxemia. But that's why people who uh, uh, have SIBO uh, have rosacea on the skin or mm -hmm. restless legs of restless leg syndrome or neurodegenerative disorders like Parkinsonism mm -hmm. or Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is also a cause. Um, now, think about this. If, if SIBO causes an increase in intestinal permeability, and the gliadin protein of wheat causes an increase in intestinal permeability. What's the result of a combination? It's lethal. It's a very, but that's what we see now. That's why we see, go to Walmart and you see astounding levels of obesity, red-faced right. people, skin rashes, joint is the deformity. And we, we have a nation of very sick people. And a lot of it has to do with wheat and grain consumption, because that's what the guidelines tell us to do, cutting mm -hmm. fat, of course, and this massive disruption of bowel flora that increases intestinal permeability and results in this process called endotoxemia. Mm -hmm. So what can someone do? It's, it's taking, cutting out the grains and the sugars, yes, that's numero uno, but can pro, do probiotics help? Or do you, should, I, I watch your videos all the time, do you have to make your own fermented foods? Or can you just go on Amazon and buy yourself a really good probiotic. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> things that improve the intestinal barrier, mucus barrier. So getting rid of the gliadin protein wheat, right? You have a dramatic, if you were tracking a blood test called zonulin, also called hepaglobin 2, you would see it drop. And uh -huh. this is true of everybody, not people with just celiac disease or gluten intolerance. There's everybody across the board. You stop eating the gliadin protein of wheat and the zonulin protein blood levels plummet. Really? Uh, so the diet's a good start. Vitamin D is important for so many reasons, but it does improve intestinal immunity. So really? it improves your the yeah. intestinal. I diet. notice I noticeably feel better when On my D. vitamin when my vitamin D levels are high, and also when I take vitamin C, I noticeably just wake up fresher. Yeah, when our I, levels our supplements. Our levels are eighty and eighty-two respectively. Right. With vitamin D, we take I take ten thousand a day, and five thousand, and I alternate. And I can't, I haven't been sick this year with a song. I mean, yet granted, we're not around people and everything, but we're like permits right now. We're, speaking right. of speaking of staying home, I would love to hear your thoughts on COVID nineteen. Just to preface, uh oh, um, <laughs> he's smirking, we, Eric. <laughs> we have, um, you know, our day job for listeners who don't know, our day job is we run a global car service. Mm. We've brought on a doctor to kind of guide us with um, protocols. And, uh, you know, for a safe way for people to be transported. So we brought on this guy, Dr. Ravi Kampali, and he helped us kind of formulate a plan to help our passengers feel safe. Funny enough, he says that the, the one way that everybody can be healthy and fight COVID-19 is if they have a better metabolic profile through eating a low carb diet. Do you agree what are your thoughts on COVID-19? Is that is that something that you would concur with? Yes, but I, one thing I want to make clear, I'm not an expert in COVID-19. I never sure. will be, never <laughs> plan to be. There are people who are in the front lines doing the research who a lot know a lot more than I do. But that all said, there are several, as your doctor points out, all the people who are at high risk uh, are people, the, the common thread is insulin resistance and inflammation. Mm -hmm. That is all these people with type two diabetes, pre-diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, um, uh, dementia, et cetera, all share flagrant insulin resistance and inflammation, which makes them much more susceptible. Uh, vitamin D is probably a big part of the answer, though it's not been proven in any clinical trial, but it's true in other settings. Mm -hmm. the, the one uh, neglected part of all this, I would say, besides not consuming grains also, 
is the microbiome once again. Yep. It's becoming, as I dive deeper into the microbiome issues, it's become clear that disruptions of the microbiome also play into a, a drop in immunity. One of the crazy things that I've been doing the last several years is so because of the things we've been exposed to, like, like let's take glyphosate. So glyphosate is the herbicide roundup, of course. Right. You know, when Monsanto filed their patents for glyphosate as an herbicide, they simultaneously filed patents for glyphosate as an antibiotic. Hmm. Oddly, it's an antibiotic of the worst variety because it's effective in killing probiotic species like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, and it's ineffective in killing the pathogens like E. coli and salmonella. In other hmm. words, glyphosate in corn or soy and in some degree in wheat selects it selects for the unhealthy bacterial species well one of the things that happens is we lose species and one of the species we most of us have lost about 96 percent of us have lost a species called lactobacillus reuteri r-e-u-t-e-r-i -E after the german discoverer dr gerhard reuter in the 1960s well we've all almost all lost this and one of the effects of Reuteri is a massive increase in your immune response. In animal studies, it's not yet corroborated. We're probably going to corroborate, try to do this, corroborate this in a human study. But in, in mice, it restores a shrunken thymus gland that shrunk with age that is the seat of your T-cell immunity against viruses, as well as immunosurveillance against cancers, by the way. Oh and re restoration of Reuteri restores thymic um, volume and T-cell uh, function in animals. We have yet to corroborate that. Another thing to know about, and by the way, Rotary also restores, it, it provokes oxytocin release from the brain, which the ladies love this because they start to lose their skin wrinkles within four to eight weeks. A massive increase in muscle mass and strength. People don't believe when I tell them I gained 13 pounds of muscle wow. uh, eating, eating a yogurt I make. We make a yogurt from it because it's our way of increasing the bacterial counts to about 200 to 262 billion as compared to the trivial counts in a probiotic. So we make a yogurt out of this. Uh, I, I, I hate going to the gym. You guys probably like the gym a lot more than I do. I can't I stand it. I, I, <laughs> so enjoy, I enjoy working out. I like working out. I go. I was going before the pandemic. I was going 15 minutes once a week. <laughs> and doing that, I gained 13 pounds of muscle in three weeks and my strength went through the roof. I started handling waste like I handled when I was 20 years old. I'm 63. Oh and so God, you uh, look great. You look restoration, great. Of, restoration of so dermal collagen explodes. Ladies go crazy over this. Strength. Uh, sleep is deeper. I'm a chronic insomniac. I sleep like a baby. Long, wild, kid like dreams flying, forgetting the lines in a play. <laughs> and really? another, your libido goes up. Guys get a rise in uh, testosterone back to youthful levels. In other words, it's as close as I I know of as a as a restoration of youthfulness. But I, I tell you all this because of the increase in immunity. Another thing that uh, your readers might want to know about is there's a wacky product, commercial product called Yakult. Y a k u l t. You can buy it in the big box stores. They actually sell it in Walmart and Meyer and some other stores. Uh, some of the Asian stores too. It's from Japan and it's kind of a crappy product because it's skim milk with sugar and flavoring, which you and I would not want to drink it, but it also has 6.5 billion counts of a bacterium called Lactobacillus casei Shirota after the J Japanese discoverer. Well, we have three human clinical studies now that show if you get a hundred billion of this microbe, your susceptibility to viral illnesses drops by 50%. And if you get a viral illness, it's abbreviated by 50%. So, so very good evidence. So where can people start? Because this is so interesting to me, and it seems like it's really accessible. What can people do to get a, a better... Yeah, yeah, how rotary. Yeah, what, 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 can, what can we do to get a better gut, gut microbe? microbe Easiest microbe. thing is just go to my Wheat Belly blog, and I've got a post there called uh, Making L. Rotary, R-E-U-T-E-R-I, -E -E Yogurt a step-by-step -step guide. There's also another post about the lactobacillus casei Shirota. Uh, so we make yogurts. And so people say, well, can I just go buy Faye or Stonyfield or Chobani? No. Right. It's all sugar. It's all loaded with sugar. <laughs> loaded with sugar. Commercial yogurt making is a four-hour or so process. Right. 
what we do is we ferment for 36 hours. Remember that kid's trick question, which would you rather have? A million dollars or a penny that I double every day for 30 days. Kids, always, I'll take a million dollars, right? Right, right? Not knowing that that penny becomes over five and a half million dollars uh, over 30 days. But if you track the you know, one cent, two cents, four cents, eight cents, seems like nothing, going nowhere fast. Well, by day 25, you're into the millions. Right. So same thing with doubling time of bacteria when you make yogurt. If it takes three hours for rotary, for instance, to double, for one to become two, two to become four, it takes three hours at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, it's not till hour 30 of fermentation where you start to get big, big, big numbers. And we get about 262 billion on my last flow cytometry measure. <clears throat> And that's what gives you these big ass kicking effects. Right. And so doubling time, extended fermentation time. You know, so pe people say, that's not how you're supposed to make yogurt. Well, we know that. <laughs> this right. is we're trying to make yogurt. We're, it's actually a bacterial count amplification system. But you do it this way and you get big, big effects. Now, what now, happens hold, Eric, hold on. I have a question I, I, about no, no, mold. No, no. I want to talk about mold. Okay, I, I, I have more questions about dairy. What happens if you have issues with dairy? What happens right. if you don't tolerate dairy well? Uh, we're all we're all allergic to dairy, right? So we, we stopped eating dairy about nine months ago. Eric's kids are anaphylactically allergic to dairy. Mm, okay. Well, several things to know. So I can't address all these, but several things to know. When you ferment this way, so you're going to find this yogurt is very tart. And that's because you've maximally converted lactose to lactic acid. Hmm. So there's very little lactose remain to cause lactose intolerance. The, the uh, accumulation of lactic acid drops the pH to about 3.5, which is very acidic. And that denatures or breaks down the casein beta A1. That's a typical source oh. of a lot of these immune type uh, reactions. I so if you haven't eliminated the problems with dairy, but you've minimized them. I see. Other options, use the A2 dairy that has casein beta A2 what amino acid different, less immunogenic. You can use sheep and goat, of course. You can use coconut milk. I've been using guar gum to thicken it up, and that seems to work pretty well. There's a whole new process to do that. Uh, you have to preheat the coconut milk, put the guar gum in. Um, so I, I, I would go on my Wheatbelly blog to get the steps on how to do that. Sure. Uh, you, I've also fermented all kinds of other things. You can for I fermented pickles. Mm -hmm. With rotary, as I ferment all kinds of stuff, by the way, you can ferment, for instance, um, like the KCI Shirota for enhanced immunity. That, 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 by the way, also gives you mental clarity. Really? Uh, you know, what's really cool for uh, guys who work out a lot or are athletes is um, uh, Bacillus coagulans, the strain. One thing we have to be mindful of when we start to play around with microbes is strain specificity, which uh -huh. sounds, I know, boring as hell, but. Uh, but it means, so we all have E. coli, probably several strains of E. coli. What if you ate lettuce contaminated by, contaminated by cow manure and E. coli? Well, you could die of kidney failure and sepsis. Same species, E. coli, different strain. So strain differences are crucial. So that's why we have to specify strains, even though it sounds awful, like the rotarized strains we use, the DSM-17938 and ATCC PTA-6475, <laughs> all in the block. Don't, don't have to memorize that. <laughs> and the, the Bacillus coagulans, the GBI-36086 strain, uh, which you can buy and make yogurt out of it, and you get these jacked up bacterial counts. And so for athletes, you know, one of the things, let's say you're a basketball player or a wrestler or a tennis player, like my tennis pro daughter, they have really grueling training and right. competition. Well, the bacillus coagulans reduces muscle injury by 50%. Wow. Meaning your recovery is that much faster. Now combine in, in someone who into their forties, fifties and onward, combine the rotary muscle gain strengthening effect with a bacillus coagulans reduction of muscle injury. And people are telling me, I'm 74. I go mountain biking and I feel terrific. I don't get sore anymore. My strength right. is through the roof. I go on uh, steep hills. So we're seeing some really cool enhancement of performance in addition to improvements in bowel health. Could you also get rotary in a probiotic form, in a pill form? Is it possible? I understand it's not as big as, as your, your, your strand. You know, the, the odd thing, Michael, is the strains we know that have these effects because <clears throat> we there are many other strains, 30242, right. uh, 360, 301, there's all these, but we don't know if they have these effects. So the only two strains we know have those effects 
are made in a probiotic called Gastrus, G A S T R U S, mm -hmm. made by a Swedish company called BioGaia. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they they focused on this probiotic, this Gastrus product for babies because it reduces infantile colic. Mm -hmm. Babies cry. It accelerates recovery after antibiotics with diarrhea. Mm -hmm. and it reduces infantile regurgitation of formula and breast milk. Look, well, we're not we're not babies, right? So right. The, these, these tablets are crafted with very low counts of bacteria for infants. Well, so when I first saw the product, I thought, well, <laughs> we want bigger numbers. And so, how do you do that? So I amplified it through this yogurt using this very specific twist of extended fermentation. We also add prebiotic fibers like inulin or raw potato starch, right. further increase the counts and also increase the thickness and richness of the final product. Mm -hmm. And also, by the way, if you're fermenting in non-dairy, it also increases bacterial counts. And by the way, you can ferment uh, sweet potatoes. Um, I've really? Pureed sweet potatoes. Uh-huh. How do you do that? Uh, you have to puree your sweet potatoes. If you want to try it and learn, buy some baby food. Huh. With nothing but a sweet potatoes and a pureed sweet potatoes, pureed carrots are as okay as a fermentation vehicle. Um, hummus uh, diluted fifty percent with uh, filtered water is I'm a making, good fermentation vehicle. I'm, I'm gonna make pickled sweet potato. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> very tasty. Yeah, no, that's that's is, if if you have I have a mold allergy, Doctor Davis. Is that a problem with fermentation? You know, <laughs> uh, by mold. Let, let me just make this point. Because um, mold allergy, of course, can mean many, many different things. Of course. I, I, so let me just address this issue. Food intolerances, allergies to a variety of things. So whether we call the food intolerance intolerance to FODMAPs or yeah. prebiotic fibers or legumes or nightshades, or you have IgG or lymphocyte testing that suggests food intolerances, or even IgE testing for food allergies, so much of this is really SIBO. Really? That is proliferation of unhealthy bacterial species that now occupy 30 feet of your GI tract. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's a new device. I have no relationship with the company. It's mm -hmm. called an air device. I just got it. I just bought it. I just, I, it's on, it's on my kitchen table. I just got it in the mail. What is it? Great. Uh, so it's a very nice device. It talks to your smartphone. You blow into it. There's a, there's a, oddly, there's a very specific protocol to use the inventor, very nice guy, right. a PhD engineer in, in Dublin, Ireland named Dr. Angus short. Well, he invented this thing because his girlfriend had IBS ear bowel syndrome and was told to go on a low FODMAPs diet, meaning low, uh, prebiotic fibers and sugars because it reduces bloating. What he didn't know was that, uh, IBS, and low FODMAPs is really just one little sliver of a much bigger problem. Mm -hmm. So when you measure hydrogen gas that bacteria produce with this thing, what you're really doing is mapping out where bacteria are in your GI tract. And the faster you emit hydrogen gas, the higher up bacteria are. So there's a specific protocol. And I ironically, you can't count on the company Food Marble, that's what they're called, mm -hmm. to provide the right instructions because they didn't know <laughs> So I told, I said, I said to Dr. Shaw, I said, Angus, you understand what you made? He said, no, what? <laughs> so I had to tell him what this was all about. So well, I've, I've posted our protocol on how to use this thing properly okay. for questions of allergy and food intolerances, et cetera. It's in my, it's in my undoctored inner circle, but it's, it's, it's a pro it's a, that's a membership website, okay. but it's a full protocol one on how to manage SIBO and also how to, uh, use this device. And by the way, we're also on the cusp of, I think, having a yogurt that gets rid of SIBO, which is oh really god. cool. Oh my god. It's amazing. So how do you help people now? You said that you're not practicing now. So how are you helping people regain healthy lives? Well, I, like what you guys are doing, talk to, to each other, provide interviews. My Wheat Belly blog remains a very busy place. It's had um, 10 million people on there over 30 million times. Oh, um, there's Facebook, social media stuff. Uh, the place, though, for real serious people is that website I mentioned, the Undoctored Inner Circle. There's an Undoctored Inner Circle where we go deep into these kinds of things, how to manage SIBO, new ideas. Can you manage SIBO with yogurt right. by carefully curating the species in your problem? Oh, let me say that point. So most commercial probiotics are garbage. Mm -hmm. they, they're modestly helpful. 
even, even because what they do is they take a species. They, they say something like this. Okay, um, Bifidobacter long seems to be a good species. Let's put a little of that in there. Uh, Lactobacillus uh, gasserite, that seems to be good. Let's throw it. But they, they don't specify strains, which means you have no idea if it's an effective strain or not. And there's no thought about collaborative effects. Bacteria collaborate with each other. They cooperate and antagonize each other. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, and of course, they're not chosen to eradicate SIBO. So I, I, care, I chose sp several species that, one, colonize the upper GI tract. That's where SIBO occurs. And two, produce what are called bacteriosins, which are natural antibiotics. Ironically, we know a lot about bacteriosins because big pharma smell gold. Because mm -hmm. they thought, hey, let's characterize these natural antibiotics because they might yield some drug opportunities. <laughs> but the but it, it also provided a lot of well-funded science in the world of bacteriosis. So when we pick species that colonize the upper GI tract where SIBO occurs, and they produce bacteriosins, and we also jack up the bacterial counts by this yogurt we make. And I we're seeing, now this is very preliminary, but we're seeing people get rid of SIBO with a yogurt. Unreal. Unreal. So are the idea of colonoscopies and endoscopies and, and stents and everything, it's just, it's a big, like you said in the beginning of the conversation, it's, it's just a money-making machine. That if people go buy Undoctored, your book, or if they, they follow the Wheat Belly program, you've seen success stories, right? Like you've seen people reverse their diabetes. You've seen people reverse their fatty liver and gain their gut bacteria uh, it, back. Correct? This is, this is, just go ahead, please. Far too many times to count. You know, Michael, it's actually, it's ironic. It's just so damn easy to do. And you've heard this. Uh, somebody goes to the doctor and he says, hey, you got fatty liver. We did your AST, ALT liver right. test. They're high. They're in the 200, 300 range. Normals, you know, a couple is like 20 or 30. Right. And or they did an ultrasound or CT scan or MRI of your liver and you have fat infiltration in your liver. And they say, well, there's nothing you can do for for it. We're going to watch you when you develop cirrhosis, which is really bad. Cirrhosis is really bad. If you ever saw anybody puking up bright red blood hemorrhaging from their esophagus, from what I call esophageal varices, they're, they're kind of like varicose veins in your esophagus from the high pressure in your liver from cirrhosis. I mean, it's a horror. We'll watch you until you have cirrhosis. Unbelievable. And then we'll schedule you for a liver transplant, which is an awful, awful procedure it cuts short your life by decades right. and yet you can get rid of fatty liver within 10 days 14 days right. what, what the doc i'll translate what my colleagues mean when they say there's nothing we can do there's no drug or procedure for it especially right. things that i can profit from right so what what they're not saying is you can reverse this by doing such things as getting rid of the foods that fuel that process Right. And it's the process, it's called de novo lipogenesis. It's a conversion of carbs, like the amylopectinate of grains, to triglycerides that accumulate in the liver. Right. Uh, address factors that uh, um, amplify insulin resistance, vitamin D, fish oil, magnesium, same old stuff. Mm -hmm. And get rid of SIBO because that flood of endotoxemia of SIBO first empties into the portal circulation to your liver and your poor liver takes a beating. <laughs> and so just attention to those basic things we've mentioned several times, the diet, those nutrients, effort right. to bowel floor, reverses bowel, uh, uh, fatty liver. And some people actually just reverse fatty liver with less effort, like just a keto diet, right. diet right. low carb diet. Right. What do you think of uh, artificial sweeteners? Well, we know that the artificial sweeteners, aspartame and, and related, uh, neotame, acesulfame, sucralose, and saccharin, hugely, uh, good evidence, hugely disrupt bowel floor and make the bowel floor, for instance, of a skinny non-diabetic person look like the bowel floor of an obese type 2 diabetic. So those are clearly very bad. This notion of diet sodas being benign is, is nonsense. It's, they're, they're horrible. But we've not had any problems, nor have any been reported, with the natural Sweet, not the natural non caloric or minimally caloric sweetener. So, we've had no problem with stevia, with monk fruit, with uh, allulose, which is also a prebiotic fiber, inulin, not the best sweetener, but also prebiotic fiber. Mm -hmm. um, erythritol has, has done okay. We tend to be use it lightly, though. 
and then xylitol uh, it used in limited amounts. One of the things I, I learned years ago is if I said, Eric, Michael, listen, eat a pure diet. Just eat meats and fish and chicken and green vegetables. And it, you know what happens? Thanksgiving rolls around. And Michael says, and come, and says uh, I gained 14 pounds through Thanksgiving. I said, right. why? He says, well, you know what? The family was serving pumpkin pie and mashed potatoes and biscuits and grain. I couldn't help myself. And then, now I have re reignited appetite. I can't stop. So right. I learned years ago that you have to give people uh, uh, alternatives. Here's how to make cheesecake and make it healthy. Here's right. how to have biscuits and gravy, make it healthy. And I've seen you, you've seen all this now. It's right. perpetuated even more in the keto world and uh, yep. paleo world, et cetera. But there are ways to recreate these foods because the, the reality is we have holidays. We've got kids. We've got grandkids. And you have a life to live. And you have a life to live with hopefully, you know, social responsibility, having friends over, you go over a friend's house. And it's nice to have a right. slice of pizza at your football party. Or some pretzels, or some cake, right, right, right. or a birthday party. So, do, so ha, have you cheated, Doctor Davis? Since you've written Wheat Belly, have you had just give me the freaking bagel right now with <laughs> load up cream cheese on it? I'm gonna eat. Have you have you had those cheat nights? No, you know because a lot of us, not everybody, but a lot of us develop very adverse reactions. Yep. So put aside celiac and all that business. A lot of us develop very very adverse reactions that range from just a little bit of bloating and diarrhea for a few hours to a recurrence of joint pain, skin rashes, neurological phenomena, all kinds of nasty stuff comes back. Uh, some people will have, let's say you got rid of your rheumatoid arthritis doing these kinds of things mm -hmm. and you have a re-exposure. Uh, it comes back and it may take six months to, oh, to leave again. And so we've all learned that. Uh, and one, one odd thing is the longer you're wheat and grain free, the more flagrant the re-exposure phenomena can be. So all of us have learned just, just not to do that. Right, right. Jumping back to fatty liver, I had fatty liver. My ALT and AST was through the roof. I think that's a pandemic in and in of itself. I don't, I don't drink soda. I don't eat sweets. But I was eating bread and potatoes. You're, you know, every right? day you eat, you eat a bagel with cream cheese, right? We're from right. New York. That's what you do here. Right. And and, and, he, and he had fatty liver. And yeah, and I had fatty liver. My, my, my mom has it too. But- I, you know, I went keto, right? And the numbers dropped. They plummeted. I did get a scan though, and I still had the fatty liver. It was, it, they said it was much less from the scan before. So it definitely was less fatty infiltration, but there still was. You're saying it, it could take 14 days. The doctor who told me this, the cardiologist who's since retired said, fatty liver's lifetime. You can't get rid of it. <laughs> on my life, Dr. Davis. Like the, the guy did a, did a calcium score on me saying, you know, you're good. Just, you know, I don't just lose weight. I don't care if you eat ice cream seven days a week. I don't care if you eat burger seven days a week. As long as you're losing weight, that's all I care about. Again, the guy retired, but you know, so fatty liver done 14 days, you know, that it can be gone. And you, you can see an odd phenomenon too. Michael sees his doctor. Michael now knows more about health and nutrition than the doctor does. 100%. Which is absurd. When you think about that, what an absurd situation. <laughs> Imagine you took your car to the auto mechanic and it's not starting and you say, Hey Jack, can you get the thing started? He says, no, why don't you tell me? I'm like, what the hell? No, 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 no. Dr. And charged you. Dr. Davis, I took my vitamin regimen from this alternative doctor who put me on it, just like you to my GP. And my GP says, this is going to kill you. This vitamin D it's going to, it's toxicity <laughs> in this. <laughs> Your laugh is contagious. I have to say, you know, you know, it's not funny. I suppose. Really. No, no, it's no, it is. It is funny. funny. It's it hysterical funny. that we're being fed a bunch of bullshit. Oh by, yeah, by, by oh, mainstream yeah. medicine, and it, it, it pisses our father. Um, yeah. Our father. We lost our father three years ago. Guy smoked his whole life. His cholesterol was one fifty. Had zero signs of heart disease. I guess that's where I get it from. I have no signs of heart disease. Never smoked a cigarette in my life. Don't do any drugs. I'm scared to take Advil and Tylenol. But like. Our father passed away. He had lung cancer. He beat the lung cancer, but the COPD got him. And uh, he read both Wheat Belly and Undoctored, and he and knew that. We, we feel definitely he he was a big guy. He was about 300 pounds. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of him having COPD and stuff like that, we put him on Wheat Belly, and, and we put him on a ketogenic diet, and we firmly believe that it added 10 years to his life. Yes. Wow. Yes. No so that's doubt. why what you guys are doing uh, – what other people in the same kind of efforts are doing is so important. You know, I don't know if you know this, but when I wrote on doctored, 
I got blacklisted by all major media. Really? So all broadcast wow. media. I, no. Yeah. For the media, media. Do, Dr. Davis, the media now is YouTube. The media now is all about YouTube. Yep. You know. So I'm grateful for YouTube, for blogs, for Thank you. even Facebook <laughs> and Instagram, yeah. et cetera. Because if we if we're no longer welcome on major media, you know, morning news, evening news, interviews, exposés, all that has come to a grinding. If anybody watches TV now, mainstream uh, network TV, you'll not see a word uttered about the astounding, systemic, deep, destructive problems in modern healthcare. None of, we, we say it, you guys say it, I say it, but it can't be said on major media because Big Pharma spends over $6 billion a year now in drug ads, and they're not going to antagonize their biggest advertiser now. They're, they're not going to put undoctored on Dr. <laughs> no. <laughs> that, that's unbelievable. But at least the internet created a place where people can go and educate themselves and you can make real changes. I mean, Michael and I are real examples of real normal guys who made Listen, real changes. Listening to guys like you we are so grateful that you wrote Wheat Belly. We are so grateful you wrote Undoctored. You're doing God's work here. And I don't want to bring religion you're saving, into it. You're saving people's lives. You're, yeah. And we have a family member who's, whose calcium score was a 700. Mm -hmm. And her uh, A1C was a, you know, a 7 or an 8 or something. It was, it was, it was pre-diabetic. But she went to a doctor like you. And her A1C is now 5.4. And she's going to get a calcium score in the next year or two. But listening to your protocols of fish oil and D and giving up the grains and the wheat and all that stuff. Um, clearly there's something to it. Clearly we've been lied That's to. That's great. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And you know what? Carn coronary disease drives hospital revenues. 50% of most hospitals revenues come from coronary disease. This incredibly easily controlled reversible condition called coronary disease. I just want to just mention, I tell we, Eric and I tell people this, we lost the weight and they go, you know, we say that, that the foods that were eaten 200 years ago, it, it, it didn't exist. And they go, well, people lived till they were 30, 200 years ago or 500 <laughs> years ago. Right. Again, like what, how, how do you come back at someone where they go, well, cavemen only, I don't know the pictures that I see are of all old people in the 1800s living into the nineties and a hundred years old, eating wholesome foods, eating a primarily meat based diet. Um, I do. Do I dare to ask about veganism too? I'd, I'd love to know your take on that as well. But what do you tell someone when they go, well, people lived till they were 30 when, you know, 200 years ago or whatever. There's, it depends on the population you're talking about, what era, et cetera. But it, speaking generally, right. uh, the uh, longevity um, uh, was colored by the fact that most death was in kids, newborns in, up to about mortality. age eight. Yeah. Right. Right. If you live to age eight, it's highly likely you live to, old age right the 60s 70s and even onwards so this idea and by the way those people uh prior to agriculture prior to the consumption of wheat maize rice etc millet there was almost no tooth decay you know i, I think that's a very telling observation so before the con consumption of grains one to three percent of all teeth recovered whether it's in children or elderly people or full grown adults, only one to 3% of teeth showed cavity decay, tooth loss, abscess, or misalignment, by the way. Yep. And then when humans incorporated wheat grains, uh, wheat and grains, 16 to 49% of all teeth showed a tooth decay or tooth loss or abscess and misalignment. And, and, but now the absence of tooth decay, et cetera, prior to the consumption of grains, was despite no dental floss, no fluoridated toothpaste, no toothbrushes, mm -hmm. uh, no dentists. Mm -hmm. You know, their notion of dental hygiene was taking a piece of, uh, taking a twig to pick out some wild fragments of wildebeest between your teeth or something like that. Yet they had almost no tooth decay, almost no tooth misalignment. That's amazing. So before we wrap it up, I, 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 I want to, piggyback on what Michael said about uh, veganism and vegetarian diet is, is what you do is, would you recommend that type of a diet for people? No, 
um, I, I, let's put aside sustainability type issues and just focus on health. So if you're vegan or vegetarian, as I was 25 years ago, and it made me a type two diabetic mm-hmm. with oh fatty God. liver, a triglyceride level of 390, HDL 27, small LDL particles out the roof, it was all and wrong. hypertensive. So yeah, right. <laughs> I was vegetarian because I followed Dean Ornish's program back then. Right. Super low fat, right? No added oils, no meats. Jogging five miles a few times a week, by the way. And I became mm-hmm. a type two diabetic, hypertensive with hypertriglyceridemia, et cetera. Uh, now, I'm not saying this because of my experience alone, but when you're vegan or vegetarian, you must supplement vitamin B12 because there's no B12 in, in plants. Mm-hmm. You must supplement zinc because there's so little zinc uh, in plant products. Mm-hmm. You can never have anything close to a truly protective level of omega-3 fatty acids in your blood that protects you from dementia, cognitive impairment, and cardiovascular death. Mm-hmm. And there's several other nutrients that you simply cannot get in sufficient quantity as a vegan. What, so I, I tell vegan, and they don't like this, I'm sorry, but right. if you must compensate for your diet with numerous nutrients, there's something wrong with your diet. Now they say, well, you tell people to take new. Well, we're taking nutrients not to compensate for the diet, but to compensate for modern life, right. like 100%. magnesium. So right. magnesium's filtered out of your water because you can't drink water from a river or stream anymore. It's filled, it's full of crap, right? Full of pesticides, herbicides, sewage. So you filter it, but water filtration removes all the magnesium. So the, what we're doing is supplementing the uh, nutrients missing from modern life. But the vegans, vegetarians have to supplement what's missing from their life, but also from their diet. And if you it's- don't... <laughs> Is it the same way with carnivore? Eric and I went carnivore and we didn't, we felt it wasn't good. It kept the weight off. We felt healthy on it. But do you feel the same way about the carnivore diet? Because again, it's like religion. It's like my, my side's right. No, your side is wrong. Do you feel that same way about um, just eating strictly a meat based diet? You know, these diet adventures do teach us things. And one of the things that uh, that diet and related diets, like ketogenic diets or super low fat Atkins, et cetera, there's one, one example of white weird stuff that happens when you do that. So if you're purely carnivorous or fail to take in foods that is vegetable products that have fibers that nourish bacteria, mm-hmm. prebiotic fibers, polysaccharides, polyphenols, those are uh, almost exclusively plant sourced. If you fail to take that in, species diversity in your bowel flora diminishes, which is not good. Mm-hmm. A lot of species die off. You lose them. But there are several species. The, the most popular one is something called Acromantia mucinophila. So Acromantia is, is a peculiar microbe. It's good to have a lot of Acromantia, and it feeds off prebiotic fibers. But if you deprive it of prebiotic fibers, as you would in a carnivorous keto mm-hmm. Atkins diet, Acromancy has a, has another capacity. It can survive on human mucus. Oh my God. So it starts to eat you. It starts to eat your intestinal lining. It starts to breach that intestinal, uh, intestinal uh, mucus, I mean. And it actually enters the intestinal wall, and you get intestinal inflammation, colitis, diverticular disease, colon cancer. Uh, in other words, you really disrupt the composition of bowel flora. So uh, having acromancy is good. So most Americans have about one to two percent of their entire microbiome uh, uh, populated by acromantia. But you get to four to five percent, oh, great stuff happens. Your blood pressure comes down, your blood mm-hmm. sugar comes down, insulin resistance comes down. You right. lose weight. You have better bowel flora, better all kind. But then when you go keto, carnivorous, etc., acromantia starts to eat your mucus lining instead, deprived oh of prebiotic fibers, and it goes up to ten percent, twelve percent. 15, but 18% of all microbes in your gastrointestinal tract. And that's when bad stuff happens. The keto people go berserk. They hate me for this, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and we have, we have, and this, 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 by the way, is not my speculation. This is very solid evidence. This has been sorted out quite uh, uh, confidently. Uh, part of the reason why is because we've had thousands of kids put on ketogenic diets for intractable grand mal seizures. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And we know these poor kids develop kidney stones. Kids aren't supposed to get kidney stones. Right. They have constipation, dysbiosis, disrupted bowel flora. Um, they stop growing. There's an occasional sudden cardiac death. In other words, there's some very serious problem. Now, 
the, the defenders of the keto diets will say, well, that's in the old days when they gave kids corn oil to jack up their oil. Well, but that's not been done for years. They give them now coconut oil, MCT oil, right. uh, oil, um, animal fat, et cetera. And yet these kids still struggle. And now we have also uh, evidence outside of the kids on ketogenic diets that show us that one of the consequences is a massive proliferation of acromancy that starts to consume your intestinal mucus lining. Oh, my God. Well, are you writing? Food. You're an encyclopedia of. He <laughs> are you Are you going to write another book? Because you, I, we devour your stuff. Are you in the process of that? Yeah, you know the undoctored uh, episode hurt me in a number of ways because you know when you're black blacklisted by all of media, it's kind of, except for nice guys like you, <laughs> other podcasters, and you know social media. Um, and it also got me blacklisted in the publishing industry to some degree. Well, that's kind oh, of receding man. now. So I finally got the attention of some of the big publishers because I realized, you know, this 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 character writes books and sells them. They're right. after selling books, right? Right. So I, I I'm having a book in the microbiome come out, which has is filled with really cool stuff. Love like it. The lactobacillus reuteri yogurt. Love it. Um, but it won't come out to January 2021. Uh, I'm sorry, 2022. Okay. Uh, and we still are working on a. I, I don't want to give you the title because we're still I'm still debating with the uh, editors on titles. Okay, right. you could do something with gut, right? Like, like you know, gut sm smut or something like that. Like, <laughs> you did, gut my, smut. My favorite. Was Listen, bowels. we came up with wheat belly. It's going to be a fantastic title. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, my my favorite was bowels gone wild. <laughs> yes. And yeah, I, I think you should have a guy lifting up his shirt on the, <laughs> on the cover. The, the editors hated it. They absolutely hated it. I love it. That's amazing. You should make that like a podcast or something like that. Dr. Davids, where, where can people find you? I mean, where can people sign up for your undoctored program? Please plug away. Uh, Eric and I are, are definitely interested in joining as well. You know, for anybody just wanting to get acquainted, of course, there's the books. And the wheat belly was revised and expanded and released just a few months ago. So that has kind of the, all the updated programs, ideas, concepts, science, et cetera. People who just say, listen, don't bore me with the science or rationale. People say that sometimes. Just tell me what to do. Day right. one, day two. There's a wheat belly 10-day grain detox. It tells you uh, in precise detail what to do. You can join a private Facebook page where we do this. We're starting one this week, tomorrow, in fact, Great. where we're going to go through, people go through as a group. And you can find how to get into that through the Wheat Belly blog. Wheat Belly blog has, I think I'm up to 2,000 articles on it now. Wow. Uh, a lot of stuff on there. If you just want to get acquainted with some of these concepts, there's also an undoctored blog. But for the people, as you point out, Michael, for the people who are truly serious want to deep, 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 dive deeply into this, including, by the way, we do the, the two-way video meetups uh, every week, sometimes right. more than that. And off for two hours, it's me talking to up to 120 people. And right. we talk about road ride. We talk about the diet. We talk about why we make tea with cloves, whole cloves, because it improves the mucus barrier. Why we incorporate green tea with cloves, because it cross-links the mucus uh, proteins and massively uh, increases intestinal mucus and provides relief from people who have any kind of inflammatory process in their, in their guts. We talk about that stuff and give you feedback. So that's the undoctored inner circle. I love that, that you promote, let food be thy medicine. And I really think that's been lost in time. And, and it's about time that we go back to what our grandmothers did and our great grandmothers did that when you had a problem, they had a, they had a, a solution for you. And I appreciate you bringing, bringing it back really is amazing. Thank you, Eric. But I think that's true. Yeah. It's certainly not coming from most of my colleagues who are mm -hmm. eager to dispense drugs and procedures. So that's why I really am grateful for what you guys do and other podcasters, social media people, because we have to do this. There's been a huge vacuum created by conventional healthcare. Yep. Dr. Davis, why don't you have a podcast? Oh, I just, <laughs> it's because I have so much, much on my plate. We've got several projects, of course, all the social media stuff, writing books right. Is, right. is a very time consuming process. I, I have, I think, 200 uh, YouTube videos, two or 300 YouTube videos now. I've been a little bit neglectful lately just because it's such a time suck to, to, to make videos as you guys know. Yep. Um, so it's, it's a matter of time. And we have several research projects that are going to be launched. We need to know, we need to know more about Rotary. We need yep. to know how many micro, you know, one thing that's not been explored in the whole world of microbiome is what's called dose response. 
So we, you know, we make two, last time we did a flow cytometric measure on my yogurt, there's 262 billion counts per half cup serving. But do we really need that many? Right. right. Or do we, certainly the, the millions you get in a, in a probiotic are not sufficient, but where's the sweet spot? Is it 30 billion, 50 billion, 100? We don't know. For virtually every microbe, we don't know. So we want to perform those kinds of dose response studies. We also have some studies we want to launch in the autism world. Uh, and mm -hmm. some other things. So uh, th those and, and designing studies, bringing people in to do it, that's very time consuming. Also, it's a matter of just prioritizing. I get it. I totally get it. Let, my, my final question, what, what's your take on 100% dark chocolate? No sugar, dark chocolate. Uh, Michael, I don't have my thinking square on that one because there are some heavy metal issues with that. Yeah, I, I do have it. And mm -hmm. I just add, you know, a squirt of stevia, monk fruit, erythritol, et cetera. I add some nuts, et cetera. But there's, and of course, there's great polyphenols, blood pressure effect, et cetera. Right. It's dilating and the field dysfunction, reversing effect, et cetera. But there has been raised some heavy metal issues with some of the products. Unbelievable. Dr. Unbelievable. Davis, thank you for coming on. Thank everybody, so please like, subscribe, and share our show with the world. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. And, and uh, yeah, everybody check out. Uh, everybody Dr. go buy this book, Wheat Belly, and go buy Undoctored, life-changing books. And go to, it's wheatbellyblog.com, Dr. Davis? Right. right. Wheatbellyblog.com. Listen to this man. He knows exactly what he's talking about. Thank Dr. You, Davis, man. thank you for coming hang, on. Hang, hang on one up. second. Yeah, hang out for two minutes. I'm going to play the outro. Thank Thanks you, for man. coming on, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.